every duelist in Yu-Gi-Oh has an ace card. This is the card that no matter what, it's in every single one of their decks. No matter how much it changes over the course of the series, this card is a mainstay. Now, an ace card, it doesn't necessarily have to be a monster. It can be anything. And sometimes duelists don't limit themselves to just one singular ace card. However, what does tend to happen is a ace monster from early in the series, if the character sticks around, gets quite a few duels, that ace monster, it's a boss monster at the start of the series as well. Over the course of the series, they get newer and bigger forms of that monster, and that new monster or monsters become the boss monsters of their deck, whereas their original ace it stays as their ace, but it's just no longer a boss monster. You see what I mean? The reason I bring this up is because today we will not be covering boss monsters. We are just going to be covering ace monsters, their favorite mainstay core monster and or card. If this video does well, we'll do another boss monster video in the future. Let's start first with Yugi and Yami Yugi. Straight away, Yugi's ace is, of course, the Dark Magician. Tell me which one you identify with, Yugi. Oh, that's easy. Dark Magician, hands down. Dark Magician is a level 7 dark spellcast type monster. Since it's one of the first ever ace monsters in the series, it has no effect. Now, the reason that this monster is Yugi and Yami's ace is due to a spiritual connection that Yami has from his past life. You see, one of the Pharaoh's loyal servants, a guy called Mahad, he sacrificed himself and fused his soul into the Dark Magician in order to protect the Pharaoh for all time. In fact, this event would be referenced in a real-life Yu-Gi-Oh card called Palladium Oracle Mahad. Pretty cool. So, Dark Magician is the definitive ace monster of Yugi and Yami. Now, there are two runners-up, really close seconds that I thought I will mention. Possibly an ace monster simply by convenience, that is the Dark Magician Girl. After this card got added to Yugi's deck, she is paired more and more with the Dark Magician. So as the Dark Magician is summoned more and more, the Dark Magician Girl usually appears on the field at the same time too. Of course, she's never going to excel to the same levels of the Dark Magician, and due to her actual ability supporting the Dark Magician, it's obvious the Dark Magician is the true mainstay. But there's one of a card, and this one is a very close second to the Dark Magician, and that is Karibo. Karibo seems to share a special bond with Yugi, since he is the dual monster spirit he seems to communicate the most with. And it is a card that he would pass on to the next generation of duelists as well. But yes, obviously, Dark Magician is Yugi's ace monster. But it's not the only Dark Magician who is someone's ace monster. There's somebody else that has it as well. And do you know who that is? Arcana. Arcana's ace monster is also the Dark Magician. However, this one is a palette swap version. His reasoning for the Dark Magician being his ace is much more superficial as Arcana is a magician, so he would play a Dark Magician. It's as simple as that, really. Next up, we have Seto Kaiba. Kaiba's ace monster is, of course, the Blue Eyes White Dragon, a level eight light dragon type monster, which of course doesn't have any effects, but it's very strong. But guess what makes Kaiba special? He was the first character in the Yu-Gi-Oh! series not to just have one ace monster, but three. Three identical aces, all of the same monster. Now, the reason for Kaiba using Blue Eyes seems to be a combination of his connection to Blue Eyes from his past life. Since his past life's love was a woman called Kasara who fused herself, or was forced to fuse herself, with the spirit of the Blue Eyes White Dragon in order to save Kaiba. So that's the deep bond that Kaiba has with Blue Eyes White Dragon. More superficially though, it's just really strong. Kaiba is obsessed with power throughout the majority of the series, and the Blue Eyes White Dragon is the epitome of that power. So it makes sense that he would use this monster. Interestingly, it's possible that the Blue Eyes White Dragon ace monster, this would have been shared with possibly one, two, and three other characters had the series taken a slightly different turn. First of all, a character named Arthur had a Blue Eyes White Dragon, which can only assume was his ace monster. Solomon Muto was given it by Arthur, so by proxy. Grandpa did have a Blue Eyes White Dragon as his ace monster too. I'm going to say that the Exodia, the Forbidden One, would be his boss monster, whereas Blue Eyes would have been like his ace in his deck kind of thing. And then if we get really speculatory, it's possible had Kaiba not ripped up that Blue Eyes White Dragon, this Blue Eyes would have been Yugi's inheritance. I can only assume that Grandpa would have given this to Yugi at some point in the series. So 
There is a possible alternative dimension out there somewhere where Yugi also has a Blue-Eyes White Dragon in his deck. That actually makes me really wonder, what if Yugi inherited the Blue-Eyes White Dragon before Kaiba ripped it up? That could make a good video. We'll do that in the future. Next up, Joey Wheeler. Joey's ace monster is, of course, the Red Eyes Black Dragon, a level seven dark dragon type monster with, yet again, no effect. But this monster is an interesting one. You see, Joey doesn't have any past connections to this monster. He has no prior heritage in Egyptian myth or legend. In fact, this card wasn't even his to begin with. He took it from Rex Raptor. So you might be thinking, well, what does this card really have to do with Joey? Why is it his ace? Why does he care about it so much? Well, the Red Eyes Black Dragon, the reason it's his ace is for symbolism. Let me explain. You see, it is established in one of the Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero movies that the Red Eyes Black Dragon represents potential, the ability to grow and improve, while the Blue Eyes White Dragon, in contrast, is the embodiment of pure power. Joey, as a duelist, is someone who grows throughout the series, so it makes sense to give him a monster that is a reflection of potential, growing into what you can become. So that's why Red Eyes is his ace monster. And it's a cool looking monster, let's not lie. However, if you wanted to argue with me and say maybe Red Eyes is his boss monster throughout the majority of the series until he gets like Guilf of the Lightning or something like that, then all right then, I'll give you one then. I guess Joey's real ace monster could be something like Flame Swordsman. Sometimes when I'm in a duel, I pretend that it's me out there on the field swapping blows with whatever card my opponent has out. Well, if you were, which card would you want to be, Joey? Uh, this one. I always associated Joey with more like warrior based decks rather than like a dragon boss monster, but I don't know. That's just me. I'll let you guys pick. Who, who do you think his real ace monster is? Now we have Taya Gardner, the undefeated duelist of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters series. Her ace monster, well, it's hard to pin down. She didn't have that many duels. However, the most likely choice is Magician of Fate. This monster's effect, for early Yu-Gi-Oh anyway, is nothing to scoff at. The ability when it's flipped summoned to add a spell card from the graveyard back to the hand. This was actually so powerful back in the day. This monster got banned for a while. I think everyone has a card they can identify with. You should see if you can pick one for yourself, Taya. Okay. I picked this one, Magician of Faith. And I know it's a translation with the name of having faith, but the whole thing about Taya with the power of friendship, having faith in each other and things like that, I guess it works that way as well, so... Yeah. If you wanted to make an argument with the Dark Magician Girl being one of her ace monsters, I, I can't really agree with that. I know she used it as a deck master during the Virtual World arc, but the only reason she did that was because she had like a prolific vision dream thing of Yugi saying to her in the dream, you have to pick Dark Magician Girl for your deck master in your next door or else you're going to lose against Crump. Hey, Yugi. I had a dream that we were trapped in a virtual world and we had to duel these five old guys to escape. Uh, Taya, this is the dream. When you wake up, you'll need this card. I will? Yep, it's the Dark Magician Girl. That's why that was there. But yeah, Magician of Faith anyway. Tristan Taylor. Now, Tristan's ace monster is Cyber Commander, a level two dark machine monster with a whopping 750 attack points. Hmm. Tristan, he's not really a duelist. He doesn't really duel, so I can kind of forgive him for having a not a great monster. This is the monster he becomes in that... um roleplay duel with Vakora as well, so it's probably this monster. Not my guys, the Cyber Commander. However, during the Virtual World arc, he uses the Super Robo Yaru Fusion Monster as his deck master, which is a level six Earth Machine monster. That monster actually has the effect to boost its attack by 1000 when it battles and can swap itself out for Super Robo Lady, and Super Robo Lady can swap itself out for Super Robo Yaru. They feel more like boss monstery kind of things. That's it's not a good ability, don't get me wrong, but it's good for some sort of ye old Yu-Gi-Oh, right? It's like a tag out fusion ability. Um, so yeah, I guess it's Cyber Commander, a level two 750 attack monster. God, if they ever make a Yu-Gi-Oh anime, like they redo the original series, but with like modern decks and things like that, for the love of all things, give Tristan something decent, please. Bakura and Yami Bakura. Now, Good Bakora, I would say, is one of the first characters in the series to have a non-monster card ace card. And that card is Change of Heart. This one is my favorite. Isn't that the Change of Heart card? Now, this card makes sense as his favorite card. It 
it's like a duality thing. There's good Bakora, bad Bakora. Change of heart. It's literally like a split down the middle, good evil kind of thing. So that makes sense for normal Bakora. But we never really get to see Bakora duel again. We slip over now to Yami Bakora. What's his ace monsters? Well, it's a it's a tie between two cards. But I think his ace monster is Dark Necrofear. The other card I was going to give it to was Destiny Board. But since it's an auto win card, I'm going to say that's more of a boss card to the deck. So Dark Necrofear is probably his ace, which is a level 8 Dark Fiend type monster with the ability that you can summon it by banishing three Fiend monsters from your graveyard. During the end phase, if this card is in the graveyard, you can take control of the opponent's monster. However, in the anime, you can possess them and do all sorts of wacky hijinks if you've got a Fiend Sanctuary on the field. It's a cool boss monster. Makes sense for Yami Bakura. My Valentine. My Valentine is the second character to have a triple threat ace monster. It's Harpy Lady. Harpy Lady is a level four wind winged beast type monster, but of course she plays a full playset of these. I think in the anime though, it's Harpy Lady one, Harpy Lady two and Harpy Lady three. Don't quote me on that one. Just, let's just call it a playset of Harpy Ladies. Later on in the series, she just plays some like Amazon S cards, but much later on in the series, she starts swapping out her Harpy Ladies for Cyber Harpy Ladies, and they become her new de facto Harpy Lady playset ace monsters because they're Harpy Ladies, but just a ton better. If I was my personally, however, I'd have picked Harpy's Feather Duster as my ace card because that card slaps. I guess Mirror Wall could have been something as well. She played Mirror Wall, it was like a big deal back in the day, but regardless. Duke Devlin. Now, Duke's ace monster is probably going to be Strike Ninja. It's a level four warrior type monster that he used in his uh, dungeon dice tool, but he did actually play it later on as his uh, his deck master. It has a real card version now, and its effect is kind of weird. Quick effect, you can banish two dark monsters from your graveyard, banish this face up card until the end phase. But he didn't really duel enough, so we could get a good grip on if he does have any aces. Orgoth the Relentless, I'm going to put that in the category of boss monster rather than ace. But that, that's an okay card. Serenity Wheeler. Serenity Wheeler has one duel and she doesn't duel very well. But she does pick Goddess with a Third Eye as her um, deck master. So that must be her ace monster, right? <laughs> it, it makes sense. Uh, Goddess with a Third Eye. It's a level four light fairy monster. And it can basically substitute itself for a fusion material monster as long as the rest of them are, are okay. She uses her ace monster to get out her boss monster which is st joan later on in the duel so i think this makes sense for serenity and if you want to put like a thematic reason on why goddess with the third eye eye serenity wheeler most known for her eye operation has to be right weevil underwood weevil's ace uh i'm actually not too sure i want to say it's petite moth since this monster is what gets the ball rolling to get out his boss monster, as Petite Moth, it evolves into a Cocoon of Evolution. Cocoon of Evolution evolves into Great Moth, and then Great Moth evolves into Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth. So that's like boss monster territory towards the end. Obviously, later on, Insect Queen becomes his like true boss monster. Later on in the series, I would have actually said something like Parasite Parasite could have been his ace. Obviously, he cheeses it into people's decks by forcing people to put it into other people's decks. But he could play it in his own deck. That was something that he could have done, but, I don't know, maybe. Rex Raptor. Rex's ace monster, I feel like the giveaway is in the name. Uh, it's probably going to be Two-Headed King Rex. It's in the name. It probably makes sense being his ace monster. Wow, this card's named after me. I'm going to become a dinosaur duelist. We never really had a backstory, did we, on why Rex loves dinosaurs? Anyway, this monster is a level 4 Earth dinosaur type monster. It's, it's, it's okay, I guess. Originally... Rex's ace or boss monster was the Red Eyes Black Dragon, but he lost it, so I think this is the de facto ace monster anyway, so it eh, makes sense for Rex. Mako Tsunami. Mako's ace is the legendary fisherman, a level 5 water warrior monster that has the effect that while Yumi's on the field, it is unaffected by spell effects and it cannot be targeted for attacks, but it doesn't prevent the opponent from attacking you directly. The reason that this monster is Mako's ace monster is actually quite nice in a way. It is kind of a memento for his deceased dad because his dad died at sea. And this card reminds him of him, this, this legendary fisherman, just like his dad. To me, that card represents my father, a courageous fisherman who loves the sea as much as I do. He gives it to Joey later on the series. Like, that's such a meaningful card as well, but fair play, yeah. So 
a legendary fisherman is a, an easy Mako Tsunami ace monster. Panic's ace monster is probably the Castle of Dark Illusions. Castle of Dark Illusions is a level 4 fiend monster that has the ability to increase the attack of all zombie monsters on the field by 200 attack. It's a little bit different in the anime. This card essentially amplifies other cards in Panic's deck, so it makes sense for this to be the ace and like something like King Yami Makai being like the boss monster or something like that. That's what Panic need. Panic need a really big monster to be his boss, but uh, it makes sense for Castle of Dark Illusions. Bandit Keith. Keith's ace monster could be Barrel Dragon, but that feels more boss monstery. I'm going to say it's his slot machine monster, which is a, a level seven machine uh, dark monster. But what makes it special is that it combines with seven completed three equip spells to give it like a big boost in attack i can see that being like his ace bones bones's ace monster is pump king king of ghosts i think this card was given to him by bandit keith basically pump king king of ghosts is a level six dark zombie type monster has the ability just like castle of dark illusions to boost up zombie type monsters attacks and things like that it's like a, an ace monster that supplements other cards in the deck if we go by Battle City, there's a bit where they show all the like the signature best cards of uh, all the duelists. And one of the cards is Bones' is Call of the Haunted. So maybe Call of the Haunted is actually Bones' is ace monster, so an ace card. And if we're going by that, then these are the ace cards of all these characters based on Kaiba's interpretation of their decks. If you want to go with them anyway. Esperoba. Although Esperoba's ace monster is probably Jinzo with its uh, level six dark machine and the ability to just say no to all trap cards. Uh, it's a great card. It is actually worthy of the title of boss monster as well. Now I did say that earlier. Ace monsters can be boss monsters if you don't get like an upgraded form of them at some point during the series. Um, so yeah, I guess that makes sense. Jinzo. Maximilian Pegasus. Now, Maximilian Pegasus, I would say, has two ace cards. The first one is probably Toon World. This is a card that only he has. Uh, he didn't print it for anybody else. He kept it for himself because it was uber OP. This Toon card as well is a reflection of his, like, childlike wonderment, that part of his personality. The Millennium Eye, darker, more sinister side, that's where the second ace monster comes in, and that is Relinquished. Relinquished is an embodiment of the Millennium Eye kind of thing, so... Relinquish makes sense. Relinquish is a really strong ritual monster, which we haven't had yet as an ace monster. It lets you take control of an opponent's monster and equip it to it to give it a boost in attack. And then if it's attacked, the damage is dealt to both players, I think, or it's just the opponent. I forget, I'd have to check the card. And we all know what this monster evolves into, which would be the boss monster. Marikishtar. I feel like the Winged Dragon of Ra is the easy answer, but not the correct one. I think the Winged Dragon of Ra is Marik's boss monster. I think Marik Ishtar's ace monster is Revival Jam. Excellent. Now I'll summon my Revival Jam in defense mode. I'd suggest you attack now before my slime creatures far outnumber you. Keep in mind that in both decks, Marik has played with an Egyptian guard. I know he didn't duel personally as it, but when he was taking over the mind of uh, Strings, he had Revival Jam in that deck to supplement his Egyptian God card, Slifer, in that one. And then when he started playing with his Ra deck, uh, he also had Revival Jam in that deck as well. He's got a slime fascination. He probably watches slime ASMR videos. Uh, that is why he likes slime cards. So yeah, Revival Jam, I think, is his ace monster. It's a uh, level four aqua monster. Water Aqua, and its effect is when it's destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, you can pay a thousand life points, special summon it in face of defense position during your next standby phase. But what makes this card especially good is he has loads of cards to help this card out, make loads of them and multiply them and things like that. And he even makes an Egyptian God slime with this monster. So I'm saying Revival Slime is Marek Ishtar's ace monster. I think that's hilarious. Ishizu Ishtar. Ishizu is a hard one to say. Um, I'm going to say it's Mudora. But I mean, like, if you wanted to go a different route, I mean, maybe like Blast Held by a Tribute or Exchange of Spirit. Exchange of Spirit could be her ace card. Like, it's the card that helps facilitate her win condition. Flip the graveyard with the deck. That seems like an ace card, Exchange of the Spirit. But I guess her boss card could be blast held by a tribute. That's like her actual win condition towards the end. But I think she just didn't play enough duels. We could really see some of her decks. So I'd like to have seen more. Odeon. Odeon's ace is probably like Temple of the Kings or probably Embodiment of Apophis, which is actually 
I quite like that as an ace, because then we have a trap monster as somebody's ace. You set this card face down, activate it, it special summons itself with like 1800 attack. I think he played a playset in the duel, I can't remember. And then obviously his boss monster would be that circuit monster, but we're not talking about bosses today. So that's a cool one for Odeon. The Paradox Brothers, I would say they have three ace monsters, which are the three gate guardians, Kazijin, Suijin, and um, Sanga of the Thunder. So each one of those are their aces. So if they get them out, they're like looking good. And obviously when they fuse them together to make gate guardian, there's their boss monster. I think they've got two pseudo ace monsters as well, which are like Labyrinth Wall and Wall Shadow. Shadow Ghoul, whatever they want to call it. Raphael. Raphael's is a really easy one. It's uh, Guardian Iatos. Uh, that's his ace monster and boss monster together. I, I didn't really see him put any um, extra emphasis on any of his other Guardian cards, um, but Guardian Iatos is like the ace. It's his pseudo mom basically <laughs> if you wanted to put like a boss monster version of this being his ace then probably guardian dread scythe is his boss monster when things go really bad but yeah that makes sense uh light fairy monster is pretty cool darts darts is ace card is probably the seal of arikalkos which he like boosts and like grows throughout the duel Qtora could be as well. Qtora is quite a strong card. They literally just absorb all damage, damage. And then you start getting into the boss monster category with like some of his other cards. So I, I think probably the Silivari Calcos is his ace card. The big five. For the big five, this is really obvious. It's who they become, basically. We've got Deep Sea Warrior. We've got Nightmare Penguin, Judge Man, Robotic Knight, Jinzo. Noah Kybers would be Shinato's Ark as his ace. Uh, it's his deck master in that season as well. And then obviously it evolves into like the, the upgraded forms. Gozaboru Kaiba, I guess his ace monster in the one duel we see him in would probably be Exodia Necros. It's his win condition as well, though. So it's just one of those things. I think with that, we've covered the majority of the important characters ace monsters so i think that'll do would you like to see this done for one of the other Yu-Gi-Oh series we can do that if you want me to uh other than that let me know what your boss monster is if you'd like to see me do this for another one of the Yu-Gi-Oh series let me know in the comment section below other than that watch this video watch this video or watch neither it's up to you thank you all for watching everybody catch you later